should we just start? Okay. Okay, we're starting. Shh. Good morning. I am Elizabeth Burnett with the Missoula Writing Collaborative, which is an organization that's existed since 1994 to put writers in the classrooms of Western Montana to enhance creative writing instruction and exposure to the arts. This year, I have had the pleasure of working with three of Ken Ballinger's junior English classes from Hellgate High School, and today we're giving a reading. Um, I introduce uh, Liz Carlisle and Islin Addington, who are going to introduce their peers' reading. All right. Yeah. <laughs> All right, first out of the shoot, we have Christine Rasmussen with Location. Okay. All right. Location. I live in the boonies, technically pretty close to the wilderness area. There are deer in my backyard and mountain ash that attract swarms of tiny black birds. Mount Jumbo rises behind us and you can see the road where my parents walk. We used to have an old swing set that was metal, but we got too big and tore it out. In the spring, lilacs on either side of us bloom and the aroma fills the air. The, glass is, the grass is dark, luscious green, except for a few yellow spots the sprinkler misses. The driveway is cracked, and the basketball hoop is getting on in years. And right in the middle of this all is my house, my home, with the hummingbird feeder in the back. Next, we'll have Dan Selvig with the Glomer. If I could make a poem, I'd call it Glomer. It'd be the best kind of poem that the world ever knew. Every bright-eyed, gurgling baby would giggle and laugh while composing Glomer upon fruitful Glomer. When writing a glomer, the professional poet would be, for perhaps the first time, on the same literary plane as the cat, looking behind and asking to go outside. <laughs> this is how it works. The glomer is the best kind of poem. Its structure is as follows. It is one word, or sound, or syllable, whose meaning is known only to its creator. So try, if you want to, to pour out your essence into a single, cultivated, fulfilling, all-containing glomer. Or at least, wait until next time you slam your toe in the dark and listen to what comes out of your mouth. All right, next up is Dustin Swanson with Poker and Pipes. smoke, pipes all empty of the tobacco, four men, dark dusters, no crying aloud, circled around a table, rotting with age, silence, glares, a dangerous scene, four suits and shots of whiskey, teeth bared, ugly sight in a time with no toothbrushes, lives precariously balanced. We'll have a work by Alyssa Young, read by Lindsay Cummings. <clears throat> Clean switch of a short skirt starts with Mr. Crispy, imported from Tunisia. An offhand wave tells a stunning cabana boy at the bar I'll have my usual, martini extra dry. A cluster of catty females with press on nails stiffly congratulate me on my win in court, followed by a reporter who tempts me into an interview with the thinnest of vanilla flavored Cuban cigars. Blowing my communist smoke in his face, I tell him I've changed my mind. 
The crowning moment is when a child saunters in, a young boy. Introducing the boy to the creme de la creme of society, I proudly announce, this is my son, Blow Me. Once upon a midnight clear, I happened upon a sandwich and said to myself, green and white fur? No, actually sprouts, which, have, which I have never in my life eaten. Cry in shame. I have never listened to the crunch of uh, sprouts. Instead, I sloppily paint my toenails violet sensation. Next, we have Reflections by Tina Campbell. It was early fall in 1953. The air smells of autumn, and I feel as though this will be my last outing before the weather turns cold. As I walk down Main Street, I see my reflection in the cars passing by. One car in particular catches my eye. In it is a girl around the age of 10. She is gazing out the window with that far off dreamy look. She is the daughter of a governor sheltered all her life. She lives in the shadow yet seems to be the main attraction. She has a smile on her face that makes me feel as though she's remembering when things were less complicated. As the cars roll past me, I think of my childhood recognizing that the smile on my face is identical to hers. Our next poet is Aram Lowe with Two Life. <laughs> to the things I love the most in life, I write this for you. Waking up under a warm blanket, defending the cold air, Falling asleep to the beat of rain, I write this for you. Pearls of a smile on a beautiful face. Stars in the back of her eyes shining right through. I write this for you. The electricity of the crowd, feeling it but not, but not hearing it. The thrill of slotting the ball in the back of the net. When all noises cease to exist, I write this for you. For everything I love in life, I write this for you. Now we'll have Short Stuff by Aaron Kenter. So instead we have Joey Verlanek with, here, squirrel, squirrel, squirrel. <laughs> I'm more likely to run over a gray squirtle. The, the nearest I've come to wearing knickers is when I was a wee little kid and I had no choice. But hitting squirrels is another thing. Those little rodents dart from nowhere, like on a kamikaze mission, bobbing and weaving to jockey for position under any tires. Like a horse jockey going down the final furlong, only to be tossed off his horse and trampled, knickers and all. Some may say that this is cruel to hit the little rodents, but I am a Darwinist, and I say survival of the fittest. If the squirrels can't belong on the ground, it should, be, it should have become a winged rodent, like bats. Next we have 4T6233 by Rachel Pratter. through the passenger side because the handle on the left has evapor evaporated. Remember to pull back the duct tape seat cover, stretching over the spot before you land. The smell of 
Whatever I had for breakfast rushing to school lingers in the air. Mascara and eyeliner take the place of a body in the middle seat. It would be too small to fit one if a human was there. The radio rattles out the one working speaker, but are only in certain parts of town, for the antenna has left us too. The rusty edges of the outside are counterbalanced by the dusty edges on the inside. If you start the car when it's cold and the fan's on, it will squeal mercilessly for minutes. If you only lift your foot off the clutch for a moment, the gears will freeze, leading to pushing and pulling the shift stick with blushing cheeks until finally Little Red lets loose and bumbles along again, only after the three lights you missed during the battle. My life was sweet... My sweet ride will not continue long. She's old and waking up each day is getting harder. Most people laugh at her. I think she's fine. Little Red. Our next poet has two short works for us today. Hellgate Third Floor Hallway, 1215, and an untitled work, Britt Carlson. hallway 1215 buff brown carpet strewn with sharp shards of glass a lunch tray abandoned hardened to all emotion milk cartons full crushed half dead half full with milk leaking bleeding on the brown carpeted floor okay this is my untitled As when a person gets, mm, as when a person gets the lab results back, sighs with relief that she is free from terminal illness and starts mapping out her dreams again. So I was relieved and happy, happily ready to continue my life after the national AP exam. We'll hear Trapped in White by Katie Fargo. Is she not here? Okay. Um, Allison Selby with her poem Grandpa. (laughs) Okay. Grandpa. My only memory of him, the humid back bedroom with the fan on high, sun through orange curtains. Sitting on the edge of the bed, sitting on his knee, he read to me, what story, I don't know. My daddy says he never recovered from the war. He threw his Air Force uniform away, and if you ever asked about it, we just didn't ask about it. I was too young to care anyway. I didn't know what war was. I didn't know what regret was. Mom said he had a heart attack. I thought a heart was a shape, not a vital organ. I didn't understand he died. I was only five. We went to live with Grandma so she wouldn't be alone with her broken heart. Our next reader is Kate D'Ambrosio. And I'm not sure if she's reading uh, both of these works or... I'm a little confused, so she'll explain. Oh, I think it's the third dirt path, but I just have more than one draft. The broken bodies of trees lay scattered across the beaten earth, their once proud stature reduced to a crumbled, time beaten relic. The very air quivers, full of expectation, anxious to, anxious to decipher the slightest movement of being in the critical but forgiving atmosphere. Smells of death mix and mingle with the scent of new life and of lives yet to be born. And throughout the air, the roar of nothingness envelops everything that is and yet to be, emptying the labyrinth of thought within a human life, leaving it alone and susceptible. The next poet is Holly Rupert, reading Chasing Life. Okay. Summer is 
late winds blow me through the raspberry fields. My arms have become accustomed to the thorns at my side. Lightning strikes, but only once do I jump at the crackle across the blue ribbon sky. I spot a house, old, worn, abandoned. Do I dare enter? The howl of the coyote makes up my mind. The door slams behind me. I run upstairs into a room and lock the door. I can feel myself slowly slipping away. I find a piece of paper, and with my soiled fingers, I write, it's dark, no phone, God, where are you? Next, we'll hear Friendship by Lindsay Ogle. Friendship. Or, the letter, though it was short, was filled with words, endearing words, so lively and full of character. I remember the times, all the memories we shared before she left. The short note, so full of color, and the words misspelled and scratchy, I can almost see her, or at least hear these words coming from her mouth. Though she is not here, she is always living in my thoughts and in my heart. The phone rings. I hear her contagious laugh. On the other line, Miles separate us, but she is still there for me, making sure I'm doing good and hoping I got her letter. Our next poem is Thank God She Left by Tom Francis. <laughs> I'm actually going to read uh, The Cold Within by Andrea Phillip. Six humans trapped in hap happenstance in bleak and bitter cold. Each one possessed a stick of wood, or so the story's told. Their dying fire in need of food, the first man held his back. For of the faces round the fire, he saw that one was black. The next man looking across the way saw one not of his church and couldn't bring himself to give the fire his stick of birch. The third man sat in tattered clothes. He gave his coat a hitch. Why should, he stick his, why should his stick be put to use to warm the idle rich? The rich man just sat back and thought of the wealth he had in store and how, he kept, and how to keep what he had earned from the lazy, shiftless poor. The black man's face bespoke revenge as the fire passed from his sight, for all he saw in his stick of wood was a chance to spite the white. The last man of this forlorn group did not accept for gain, giving only those who, to those who gave to him was how he played the game. Their sticks held tight in death's still hands was proof of human sin. They didn't die from the cold without, they died from the cold within. Our next poet is Genevieve Anderson with an untitled poem. As when five young kids march through the house playing a plastic band set to no particular tune at all, fighting over the honor of banging on the bass drum, bickering about who leads the tiny troops through the dining hall and circling around into the large parlor, the tambourine clanging from the, top of, from the tap of a six-year-old toe-headed boy, so the low-pitched loud clang of a four-tourist sedan slamming into the Nissan Sentra sending it skidding into the Ford F-150 pickup ahead. Brakes squealing and the unhealing pains, both physical and emotional, the loud clang that sent the first car to the dump. Next, we have The She Poem by Katie Knowles. My friend is anorexic. Mom pushes too hard towards the door, the wall, the floor. Grounded for B average grades, excels at math, has a poetry notebook. Watch her draw a cover, poem in third person, emotional upheaval, buried in middle of collection, mere image of future, ink only two months old, piece of self left on page, 
disguided by tense, misguided girl, leading me to believe the false she, not seeing replacing me, cry for help, me unable, make her feel proud, good poem, heart-wrenching, personal now, still dissecting friend who's fallen apart. Her subconscious conscience leaked out. My friend is anorexic. Mark Terrazas is next with an untitled poem. now brown from rust, cannot be heard, for it is still outside and the blades are stationary. If there was a breeze, that old wheel would start turning and the support shafts would squeal from the newfound movement that had been lost. There was once life in that old windmill, but now it has been forgotten and lost. Next up is Katie Seaman with her poem, Until the Next Person Comes Along. As when you fall down the stairs, everyone laughs. The feeling of all eyes on you, not knowing what people are thinking. Walking down the hall for the first time of the year. Old friends or new enemies made during the long summer months. Wondering if anyone cares about what you are wearing or the fact it took three hours to pick it out. You only worry for a minute, because like when you fall down the stairs, you will be forgotten within minutes or at least until the next person comes along. And this is I'll Be Fine by Anna Regal. I'll be, I'll be fine. I had a wonderful life before I was so rudely w ripped away. Everything was perfect until that day. They wrenched me away from you, the only person I ever knew. You'll come to retrieve me, I know you will. Months later, I'm still here, where are you? I'll never give up, someone will come and take me away. Did you forget me? Why did I wait around? I knew better. Now I'm alone, all on my own. You want me to sprint back? Forget, just as you forgot. No, that's a lie, just as you are. When will I grow up? I already have. I can survive without you. I refuse to die waiting. You will never learn. You're too old and stubborn. If you could listen, maybe I could love you again. My love is elsewhere, searching for trust. I can't love you. Writing my heart would rest. You betrayed me, your only kin. Oh well, I'll be fine. Not like it's a sin. We have Mariah Weston with Away. As when alone in a room full of people, the silence ringing in your ears, ongoing and unstoppable, annoying and uncomfortable, wishing for the noise to stop, questioning what could happen if it did contaminating your sanity. So was the sound of her tears echoing through the windows as we drove away, away from home to forever live away. Our next poet is Dave Cromwell with an untitled work. Not so sweet home, but far from straddling a line of bitterness, rather simply plain, like a saltine, I guess. Like air, you can feel it and know it's there, but you don't think of it. It has a smell, but I can't really, it can't really be described. Somewhere between last night's dinner and the smell of fresh carpet. 
where my older sibling still denies he had 50 of his closest friends over while my parents and I were gone, where I've thrown out every single emotion in existence only to have them ignored by the blank walls, where mom, I didn't do it, will forever echo throughout the rooms. And now we'll hear from Miss Elizabeth Carlisle with her poem, Break. It was like the two years between marriage and divorce that must have seemed eons to Dad, based on the heavy-hearted way he talked about his two other daughters, who seemed more shadows than people. The parting that was like the slow ripping off of a band-aid, which clings to every inch of skin and leaves a lingering sting in each hair follicle. To give my cat and constant companion to eternity, Death is much longer than an instant, 10 seconds after the euthanasia injection, when it is the process of two souls struggling against the impassable chasm that separates them. from fifth period is Islan Addington with Just a Little Blues. <laughs> I'll never be tall and I'll never be thin. And that's where my blues begins. I had a sweet baby and it was good for a while, but soon I could tell we'd never walk down the aisle. The snake, he deceived me, and he put me down, made me play his games till I always wore a frown. So I got out, and I broke his heart, but he broke mine first. Yeah, he ripped it all apart. So now there's this chick who thinks he's the man. She weighs 80 pounds and has a perpetual tan. <laughs> but it's all right. Yeah, it's okay. I'm doing fine. And there'll come a day when I'll move on, and he'll just be in my past. And if he thinks any different, he can kiss my big fat ass. <laughs> Which brings us around to where we begin. I'll never be tall and I'll never be thin. Uh, before I start a period, could we have everyone who's absent from first period please raise their hands so I don't have to call out their names? <laughs> Jessica Hilly will be our first reader from first period. <laughs> okay. Um, my poem is entitled Mom. She's afraid of never experiencing. Experiencing what? I don't know. Complaining that she was too young to have kids, that she was too old when she started kayaking. I can recall the days when I was too young to re realize her unhappiness. And looking back, she was always changing the color of her hair, fiery red, golden blonde, chestnut brown, trying to change her heart through a box of L'Oreal hair dye. She's always speeding through everything, yelling, pushing ideas that shouldn't be pushed. And when you ask her to slow down, to stop yelling, She'll turn to you with fiery eyes that somehow remind me of light bulbs. And she'll scream, I'm not yelling. And yet sometimes, rare sometimes, her lights are dimmed and you can read her vulnerability on her face. Being 16 and having all the wisdom a 16-year-old can have, I can tell you I will never hold more pride in one person than I do for my mother. And still I don't know if I can hold more sorrow for one person either. So next time we dance hand in ha hand, <clears throat> to Love Shack by the B-52s. I will try to show her what she has to be proud of. And when she tells me I didn't fall off the turnip truck yesterday, I'll tell her with all my wisdom that I didn't either. Next we'll have Holly Williams with her poem on the first day of high school. Scraping the white.
white bitter membrane of the orange out from under my fingernails was the nuisance. But then, with delicate fingers pulling the sweet sections of the juicy fruit apart and savoring with peach lips and leaving a yearning on their surface after the orange had been devoured. High school is as the section fruit. You must shave off the bitter membrane before you can trickle the sweet juice down your throat and remember the sweet days of life. Win Renz with her. No, indeed. <laughs> this one's called Criminal Heart. He has the grip to let you out of life and consciousness, naked against a cold, wet slate of ice and heat of pain and an ambience of white light, blade slicing through the tissue of your heart and his criminal vessel pumping testosterone and gore into a single sponge of petal that is dripping wildly with unrelenting love. <laughs> Next we'll have Miss Debbie Joyce. <laughs> Alright. Okay. Mewita Me Teyamo. The sweet familiar voice tearing me from the embrace of my bed. The canine who I'm convinced is a runt slobbering my hand. His bobbed tail shaking uncontrollably. Te amo, mi vita, te amo. The imp inside poking fun at my father and sister for no reason at all, just for joy. The letter from another continent awaiting me at the computer. Opening the voice of my friend excites me like a kid unwrapping gifts at Christmas. Mi vita, te amo. A favor to me, my brother, te amo. Te amo, the land where the heavens are colored by gone, it bursts with brightness, but gone before you wish. Mi vita, te amo, my sister, who although younger will forever be taller. Mi vita, the friend who's been by you always. Te amo, the feeling of happiness overpowers me in sugar days and my friends think I'm crazy. <laughs> Robin Sampson. called Here, Piggy, Piggy. <laughs> Down a waterside of mucus through the pink tunnel, citric lemonade irates the fleshy sidewalls of the throat, exhausted from the fright fest of a lifetime. Beating hard, pumping blood and venom alike through the pink flushed body, the heart screams to rest. But life, too precious to abandon, is about to be demolished by a soon-to-be bundle of bacon. Double left, dodge the corkscrew tail, jump on the picket fence, the blubber lay still, following the crash into the slop trough. Sipping lemonade, a pink delightful meal is preparing itself on the rotary. A glowing apple shines a gleam of my satisfaction. Perhaps next we shall have Lindsay Harrison. Gaelic. Uh, dear Gwitch, poetry is random words put together that are supposed to have a deeper meaning than they really do. In totre, meaningless words that make up lines, useless phrases. Konasatatu, adjectives that describe someone. Ismisha Lindsay Harrison, Isasnasta in Tandam. Poetry is the likes and dislikes of someone. Nimath spiders. The feelings of someone expressed by meaningless phrases that sound pretty. Tame ke ma, slan pog mahon. Lori Dorward. Home club. 
close by. A rickety wagon I always feel is mine. Wheels half hinged, squealing with air, as it tries to bump along a path I created. I watch the neighbor girl, half-heartedly jealous, the wagon I've seen her create, gliding faultlessly, so completely secure, I understand. Wheels so sturdy and bound, the walls and valleys and peaks created are hell. I return to mind, the words seemingly overflow, the sides I forgot to create. Sometimes I dream and awake to find a glowing model, all my own, with glassy walls and chrome wheels, a flashy smile, that neighbor girl with a jealous eye. Mr. Ross Warren. Jagged glass shards, waiting alone in the silence, the result of a 7.0 on the Richter scale. The silence broken for an instant by an unanimate objects, crashing to their deaths, one by one, they will be no more for an instant, brought to life by an earth-shattering explosion, a force only to be left there, seemingly dead, taken apart, of everything they once were. How does one step from the falling to their deaths? little pieces of a previous existence, gone forever after today. Scream when you step on one jagged piece, going into foot, sever major artery, river of hate drying up in a nice red pool beside you. Jenny Palmer. is called 13 ways of looking at a flip-flop. The flip-flop looks pitiful as I leave in the morning. Flip-flop smacks the bottom of my foot as I walk. Why is my flip-flop so simple yet so cool? Flip-flop is my most comfortable pair of shoes. They're all I wear in the summer. White with a dirt smudge shaped like my foot. Flip-flop like a snow hair in winter. The indent of my heel always there for me to be comfortable. Mom always says, throw those old flip-flops away. The shadow of, from the sun as it waits on my bedroom floor to be worn. Do you other shoes love the flip-flop also? Have your flip-flops ever been to Tahoe? I keep my flip-flops safe by not walking through mud or anything else that would get them dirty. You are high and I see the bumpy bottom and it looks like a cloud through rose-colored glasses. The calm blue sea rustles against the rocks in a slow rhythmic sound, always keeping time like a metronome in the back of a room. The clear water stretches to the shore only to return in a beat back to blue calmness. The soft blue sky seems to drizzle into the sea. The water reaches a little further to the shore and paints the dry rocks, glistening in the soft sun like a bowl of unpolished diamonds. Mr. Damien Hibbett. It's the little things that tear you apart. You feel the sadness inside your heart. You begin to wonder, why do I bother to give so much love to another? Seems every day brings new pain. Why do you do this over again? Suffering for things you cannot change, working so hard for goals out of range. You go to school and you run and play. You tell your friends it's all okay. You laugh a lot so your friends don't know that when the bell rings, you just don't want to go. It's hard to follow what is right in this world of darkness and light. You just wish you could count to 10 and make your life make sense again. Here. Oh, I see. She skipped out on the All right. How about Ashley Brittner? Is she here? <laughs> this is called My Friend So Far Away. 
I constantly find myself looking back into the layers of time, to that dark day, my face squished against the window, gazing outside, making sure I absorbed every last second as you disappeared up the stairs with a wave and a smile. My tears rained down from my face as we all huddled together, thinking of how just five minutes before you were standing there, then snatched cruelly away. My jumbled mind walks back to the times I almost wish I didn't know you, when anger tore through me, my violent eyes full of hatred. I want to cry when these thoughts flood my heart, giving it a heavy, painful texture. It's so ironic, isn't it? The days we had you at first seemed countless. When I feared I'd never rid of you, like a horrid habit, time crept by so slowly. I thought of those days as a smoky cigarette burnt on the tapestry that is my life. <clears throat> now you're too far away to grasp. You are so far, you seem imaginary at times. I wish I could hear your voice again, see your shining face, smell the yellow ginger floating across you, but I know that patience is the only way I can endure the next six months. I gaze out the window again and think of the sea of bodies scented with the music of our youth that I almost lost you in once before. The four of us sitting together with a smile of laughter upon us. I wish I could tell you how much I miss you, how not one day goes by that I don't want to see your face, how I swear with my entire being to never take you for granted again. Chelsea Blake. Okay, mine's called Beyond Wonder. Purple, pulsing with confusion, lost among a sea of many, blue. Exotic in its own persistence, it follows you today, tomorrow. You think for future thoughts, an ocean, green, trembling. Waterfalls crash, mist lifts. I see a face, a rainbow. Brown eyes sparkle with misery. Another heart jumps, falls, crashes. Fly with a raven, see the world from above. Don't fall, don't doubt, learn. Trust the wind as it carries you. Catch a look, mimic it. Laugh with butterflies until the world is green. Flowers brace the light. Clouds wander aimlessly as we look upon our lives with all it shows us today, tomorrow, forever. Mine is entitled, The Place I've Never Been. <laughs> the water creek leaks up into the clustered habitat of the unknown. This place, this nowhere land. Inside, the beauty flourishes through and throughout, without a care or a thought. The fragrance carried is unimaginable to the conscious self. And the presence of life is all around, curling up around my chest and between my toes. Johnson. <laughs> Douglas Johnson, he follows me to the bus stop. Douglas Johnson, he smells of herbs in the summer. <laughs> Douglas Johnson, his skin is rough like tree bark. <laughs> Douglas Johnson, he has a house of orange peels. <laughs> Douglas Johnson, he can't read Spanish. <laughs> Douglas Johnson, he waits for me in the silent forest. <laughs> Douglas Johnson, he's not green. Douglas Johnson, his grandfather lives in the trees in Belize. <laughs> Douglas Johnson, he ate my little brother. Douglas Johnson, he smells of frozen herbs in the winter. <laughs> Douglas Johnson, you're underwater. How do you swim, Douglas Johnson? Douglas Johnson, you made me smell like herbs. And fittingly, Douglas Johnson. called Poetry Rules. 
Poetry is an image that is new and exciting and something we have never thought of. Like, for instance, easy cheese in a can. Squeeze it and cheese comes out. Squeeze me and poetry comes out. <laughs> poetry is a hammer and I am the steel. Beat the steel with the hammer and it rings. Beat me with poetry. I just make funny noises. <laughs> poetry is like earwax. Once you get it, it stays in your ears forever. Poetry is a banana split. Your head is the banana, and there's always too much poetry to fit in your head, so ice cream spills out the sides. Hey, poetry rules. remains is me, so you're going to have to suffer through some of my poetry as well. Uh, home is the mythos that is woven when we are wrapped in coarse cream stucco or red security brick, in wide and flavored adobe or in replicate aluminum siding, in mountain scented cedar or coffee cake shale, antiques roadshow glass or the miracle of modern plastics, elder skin paper or the gamma ray defense of lead, water slick ripstop nylon or raw bone steel, semiconductive stil silicon or s fox fur fabrics, black flexed graphite or blossoming shrubs, romantic concrete or feathered crabgrass, seafoam green paint or goose down fiberglass, reassuring stone or toxic mercury, cardboard, cork, copper, tar paper, rubber, composites, hair, nails, teeth, and skin. For love. To all the ladies out there who may or may not want to get bare, I want to love you. I want to make your heart turn a beautiful hue. But I don't know, is that where you want to go? It's just not as, <laughs> I'm just not as suave as I wish I could be. I can't read your signals. It's like a foreign language to me. Body language, like a hieroglyphic script. The ability to translate, I'm just not equipped. If only you'd make the first move. Then I would know where we're both in the same groove. Like a record, we'd be playing the same song instead of my track getting skipped because the intro's too long. <laughs> we could be close. When we felt lonely, we could just take one more dose of each other's love. But instead, I sit here wondering how to spear your heart for mine, to have and to hold, if I may be so bold. But to all of you ladies, this poem is for you, because until I find someone, I'll be feeling blue. Next is Jordy Guffin. poem's called School Sucks. <clears throat> Roses are red, violets are blue, school's pretty bad, and tests suck too. Last period was foul, the worst of the day, want to skip tomorrow, come on, what do you say? School's pretty worthless, takes too much time, almost as worthless as a little street mime. Why do we have such a terrible place so teachers can throw homework and tests right in your face? I can't believe I'm writing this big piece of crap, I think it's all a plot, a big teacher trap. I'm now supposed to revise and make it all better, but all I can think about is Mr. Ballinger's funny-looking sweater. <laughs> I didn't want to write this in the first place, you know, and now I have to write more. Man, this really does blow. Thank you. Um, next, we have Evan Young Pete. <laughs> First of all, I would like to say that I like Mr. Ballinger's sweater. Yes. 
A ripe tomato adjective. A medium rare T-bone noun. What is poetry but food? Trying to feed, fill up every huge red rock canyon and every sidewalk crack of the mine. Mr. Peanut. I'm squishy and delightful, naive, so friendly, yet still, my friends all torment me because for some reason it gives them a thrill. They call me Mr. Peanut, sans monocle and cane. My body's shaped like the planner's guy, and their degrading comments just drive me insane. Why must they torment me so? What did I do to deserve it? They poke my fat and rub my cheeks, say that my belly's a bottomless pit. Life, it seems to me, is bleak and harsh to feel, mostly because I'm a little chunk and always looking for my next meal. Because of the waves of torments, I never walk out my door. I sit and think of all my friends. Is it five or merely four? At long last, when the years have all gone by and they're dead and gone, I'll sit at my computer and heave a contented sigh. Our next person is Tanya T. Dog Dickinson. My poem is called, Hello. <laughs> Boom Balada. Peppermint Adventures, Zoom Zoom. I want to ride my bicycle. I want to ride my bike. I want to ride my bicycle. I want to ride it when I like. Hot popping potato chips. <laughs> hot dog. I like the hot dog. I am an angry folk singer poet lady, and I've got a ticket to ride. Shut your eyes, we're almost to Mount Vernon. My heart is climbing the ladder. Thank you. CJ Black. Stew life, leftover cheese sandwich, hard and lifeless stench from the molding process, even the crumbs encumbered in a thick bluish green growth, the cheese oily and dark, corners curled towards the sky, behind the fridge, out of grasp, the old sandwich will remain food for the bugs. <laughs> is Kayla Lalamir. Okay. Mine's called skinny dipping. Red, yellow, orange. Rising, the sun glistens. Cool, crisp waves lap around bodies. Three beings all related in some way, sharing secrets at five in the morning. Peachy nakedness swirl with turquoise silk. Little ripples collide as another repels. Material possessions disregarded on the deck, hoping members of the opposite sex aren't peeking. Carefree, no worries, alive and useful. L. Chaucer? Larson? Chaucer? <laughs> the hell? Alright. <laughs> Jesus Christ. Leroy was a sorry little freak. He did nasty, petty things every single week. He watched girls in the locker rooms after gym classes, his greasy face smiling beneath fogged-up glasses. 
With shaggy hair shining and a face full of zits, he reeked of a stench emanating from his pits. A nasty scrawny body and a huge head to match, a weird and adequate scrub your eye he would catch. With clammy hands and a pale complexion, he's kind of people that have their own special section. In the bathroom where he eats lunch, quizzing himself on Pythagoras and the, pl and the playmate of the month. He set his eyes on Mallory one day, his German-fested braces glinting in the sunray. Biff was the definition of a dude indeed. He was monstrous ripped and couldn't hardly read. He smacked around little guys and talked quite loud. He was the kind of guy that would make Paul Bunyan proud. A keggy shotgunned every other night. He devoured a geo with just one bite. He dated a hottie with a nice hard body named Mallory. He crushed boulders, wrestled grizzly bears, and flossed with a tree. He also played D-tackle, laid nails, and had a forehead of steel. To see a man check out his woman would make him real. His neck, his neck was the size of you, no doubt, with a swing of his fist like a light you were out. If there was someone that he could pick that he wanted to kill, it was that sweaty, grimy Gomer, Leroy, who would fit the bill. Our two protagonists met on this stormy night at the start of a surely prejudiced fight. Biff saw Leroy outside Cyber Shack. On Biff's chick, the nerd was laying the mac. Biff's fist quickly unhinged Leroy's jaw. Leroy was a bit startled at this attack of his maw. So quickly, as a hasty retaliation, the pimply punk kicked Biff in the junk and began to run. Sooner or later, so surely the case, Biff was making hamburger from poor Leroy's face. His garbage was aching from the swift kick, so Biff paid him off with a sharp lick. Later, Leroy is lying in the hospital, we see, with a back broken and caved cranium, enters Mallory. She is sick of those handsome, tough guys with balls of steel. She wants a normal guy like him, someone real. Finally, as if this poem weren't long enough, Leroy hooks it up with Mallory and uh, long let's get some stuff. Ha, he says to Biff with tears on his grizzled face. You may have won the battle, but you surely lost the race. jump. Early summer, late afternoon, and different black shadows stretch across sunny driveways in a peaceful neighborhood. Sweet fragrance of flowers just beginning to bloom floats across the still air. Two young boys, friends, with large helmets slopped on their heads. I mount my red bike, my beast, and pedal for the jump. Ah, oh, crap. Metal meets concrete, gnarled. Flesh meets concrete, gone. <laughs> the sticky sweet taste of blood coats my mouth. Salt water streams down my cheeks, on my knees, on my feet, in the arms of a caring mother, pain soon forgotten, wounds healed, back on my red bike. Okay, I called this one home. The only warm sanctuary in this cold world. Bright sun's rays shining through the cream-colored blinds. The smell of chlorine from the hot tub. The everlasting smell of snuggle laundry detergent. The suffocating feeling of God's wonderful presence, of love, of family, of a place where I belong, a safe place. My father always told me that your home is your home until you can't remember your own phone number anymore. 258-5216, I still remember. <laughs> Um, Tyson Beerwag? Beer something? Um, is he here? Yeah, thank you. Sorry. <laughs> uh, my poem's called Straight from the Heart. <laughs> if you were a piece of paper, I would be your ink. If you were a piece of doo-doo, I would be your stink. We go together like Avid and Costello. Hansel and Gretel, mellow and yellow. Yeah. <laughs> if you were a face and love was a fight, then I would rearrange you. Oh, yes, I just might. I'm a remote control, and you're my favorite channel, girl. I dig you like a mole. I want to hump you like a camel. <laughs> In my poems entitled Olies, uh, a team that was perfect in so many ways, a team of players just like Willie Mays. Andy, Neal, Dustin, and Mike. We all rode to our games on our nice, huffy bikes. Uh, through the years, through, through three years of play, we never had a loss. We were amazing, but at a large cost. Practice, 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 our coach would say. So we'd play, play, play all through the day. The snacks were good, the victories better. But all we cared about was feeling as light as a feather. slowly 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 it starts to catch up with him the many years of living life in the slow lane starts to affect 
The picture of the extremely obese man slowly dipping his hand into a bag of greasy potato chips while sipping on a Diet Coke that maybe, just maybe, will magically cut down on his weight. In direct correlation, his heart and his mind slowly clog up as all his inhibition slowly floats away. Sitting and seeing the picture of that stupid Richard Simmons guy going across the TV saying, you can do it, as if he knows what it feels like to slowly melt away. Just then, Richard Simmons has finally motivated him. Not slowly, but as fast as a 350-pound man can, he jumps up and starts doing the exercises. Just as he has decided he has the will to live and be energized, the pain slowly but, slowly but sharply stings up and down his right arm, left arm. The heart has given up. The unusually slow beat of his heart spreads up to his, sp speeds up to an unruly speed. He knows that it is over, and he is scared. The heart has slowly given, given way, and it is time to leave. Slowly, he drifts away. Rose Hardy. Healthy hearts. The grainy black and white images and screen on a screen, valves open and close, shadows of what my heart is on a screen. Small children with broken hearts and sticky hands watch a different screen of bright colors and happy stories where boy gets girl and their small innocent eyes gaze as they stare without wonder but belief in that screen. Whirr. Parents watch another screen and a gray impersonal probe searches for the heart. Parents watch with disbelief the sickening smell of latex gloves seeps into their brains. A low but insistent beeping is heard in all minds and the loud swoosh of blood through the valves and a cry to the parents. Overpowering all their thoughts, pounding in their heads, a silent tear glides down her face. Will my child be happy and healthy? Will I watch him grow up with green grass squashed under his tiny feet? Boy and girl kiss on the other screen living their vibrant, happy, and healthy lives. Grace Johnson. My mother's puppies. Outside, the snowy wind hissed against the windows, and we spoke of times to be. And when my mother sat outside on, on a cool autumn morning and having conversations as we had, knowing that she was young and in love and having puppies, as I want puppies. With his warm, secure hand on my flat abdomen, pulling me nearer to him and laughing about my mother on a night a lot like ours, wanting nothing but spicy red curry and dreaming of having kittens, as I want kittens. We smile about getting up in the middle of the night for ice cream and getting up early like when my mother left the house in a white Spanish dress and no shoes, knowing that she can't really convince she was having furry creatures, as I want furry creatures. And now our own dear Lucas with Coconut and its sequel, Coconut 2. I've never smuggled a coconut past customs. <laughs> well, I've never been through customs. Guess I haven't smuggled a coconut either. But that can't stop me. I like coconuts. A lot. Nobody, not even customs, can stop me. <laughs> All right. Coconut, too. The sun lifts its groggy head above the horizon and roars. Bursts of sunlight spread forth in an explosion. A sleepy coconut wakes his buddies from the warm night when he is plucked from the tree like a baby from its mother. Kidnapped. Stolen. Gone. After a long, violent trip to the cargo bay, under coach, the coconut is found. Cousin's agents stared down on it like a heretic. The coconut finds its way to an uneasy death in the office. 
the CEO of Customs. Um, there's only me left, so this is um, one sentence on poetry. And I'm going to do it slow. Sorry. Um, considering the fact that peaches grow on trees, and my aunt and uncle once had peach trees, but they rotted, and simple strange boys who haven't washed their hair and has now faded to a nice mute gray. And that seasons come and go, and it always seems like you're starting over, but really you're just repeating yourself again. And trains that run through your mind on a thousand tracks, skipping from one to the next, so you don't know where you've been or where you're going. But ideas sprout from new ones, and you go from trains to your grandmother in California who teaches yoga, and you don't know where it came from. Considering all these facts, you really don't remember where you started. speech or anything, but um, we wanted to thank you so much for all your hard work and coming to our class and taking the time for us. And we put our money together and we got you some flowers. Um, so yeah, thank you very much. See you one more time next week. So it's not over quite yet. Thank you. These are beautiful.